to now what is called a core skill and perhaps wasn't at that point of time, so very much a pioneer. Uh, and we'd like to talk a little bit about that, what it was like being a young, young cricketer, young sportsman, um, what it meant to focus on fielding when it maybe wasn't as cool, and uh, just lots of different questions from, from the young, young kids. Uh, I think you've had a couple of days on the field, but really talking a little bit more about preparation, energy, how to be prepared for match dates. I think we have a little bit of an echo here. Is it some feedback from can, the... Can you guys hear us clearly or is it... It's fine. Sounds good. You, you can right. hear? Okay. I think maybe it's just the echo here. Uh, but I think first, uh, as a young person, you played a lot of different sports. Uh, I played hockey and cricket. You played much more than that. And that's probably where our similarity ends. But talk us through early days of being a young jaunty, uh, how did you pick your sports, uh, was there a thought process or just the first things you ended up wanting to do, you, you played? Thanks, Dundit. I think what, Maybe we'll back. yeah, back a little bit. The interesting thing, the interesting thing for me is that you, you come to a facility like this and I know six is a part of this incredible facility. And, uh, you know, Ryan and I have been working together for a year. We've worked in India, we've worked in six different countries. And you can have great facilities, but great facilities doesn't mean it's been utilized correctly or properly or to its, its fullest capacity. And the six community, the mums, the dads, the boys that are here from every age group, certainly add a huge element to that because you can have the best facilities in the world, but if you're not taking advantage of it, it really is a shame. And in those two days, Ryan and I are sitting down. There's never once where we've said, man, that was a waste of half an hour. I mean, we've just kept going, kept going, kept going because of what these young players put into it. So it's a great to see. The only concern for me is that as a young cricket player growing up in South Africa, we had very defined sporting terms and seasons. So hockey or football in the winter, cricket and tennis in the summer. And the interesting thing is that the only reason why, I, maybe not the only reason, there were two or three reasons why I was a decent fielder. One, I was a very average batsman, so I knew I was never going to make it on my batting alone. The second thing was that there was no other coach. You had one coach. And too often you see at practices at schools in South Africa especially, you see 15 players waiting for the coach to hit them the ball. So one coach has to deal with 15 players. When I've done seasons with, with Mumbai Indians, um, we've got four or five coaches with 20 players, but every time we have a fielding session, there's three or four players, or sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. So it's really important to keep young players motivated. You know, not just motivated from a, you've got to be the best in the world, there can't be any fault. A lot of the motivation is enjoying it. So what we try and do is bring in skills and drills into the game while still having fun. And that is a key element of what I love my fielding. So if, if you can remember me diving around the field, Hopefully it was with, with a big smile on my face. Not because I knew the cameras were watching, because <laughs> no one really knew anything about fielding, but I would really love to be in the field. So the fact that I had the opportunity to play different sports, I had different skills from football, from tennis, from hockey, and all of those sports combined to make me a good fielder. Because there was no coaching. Uh, there's one image of me running in Zimam Ol Hakkar, diving into the stumps. And the only reason I had to dive at the stumps is I didn't back my throw to hit the stumps. So I backed my speed more than my accuracy. Now that obviously improved later on the more time I spent playing cricket for South Africa and working on my fielding. Because then it was just something that I loved to do. So really important that we can encourage young children at this sort of facility to mess around, play a bit of badminton, play a bit of football. Sure, cricket is your core love and, and what you want to do. But the other sports that you play will add to your cricketing skills. And I never got to pick being a cricket player. I mean, there might be India's next badminton champion sitting here, yeah. for all we know. Yeah. It really is important because I thought I was a hockey player and a soccer player. You know, cricket was something that I was very nervous. I would get very nervous to go and bat. But fielding, I had no nerves whatsoever because no one was expecting anything from me in the field because there was no fielding expectation. Mm -hmm. Now it is a third element, a key part of the game. In every end, not just T20, but in tests as well. Because I was telling the guys here, if Virat Kohli is batting against you in a test match, you don't want to give him a second chance. If he gives you half a chance, you want to take it. Otherwise, he's scoring double hundreds. So I love to be in the field. And the other sports that I played allowed me to be the cricket player, the fielder that I became. And how did cricket become your, your primary sport? 
Well, amazingly, uh, as I said before, football and, and hockey were the skills or the sports that I thought I was better at from a skill point of view and very effective, good goal scorer. But we in South Africa were still not yet a democracy in 1992. So in 1991, September, the South African cricket team toured India. That's right. So three ODIs, I think Eden Gardens and then in Delhi, but uh, Delhi in, in, a, in an athletics track. So it was quite interesting. But I was still at university. I didn't come on that tour. Uh, they then had a, a World Cup in 1992, and the only reason the cricket team or the cricket boards were, were invited because in apartheid in South Africa, apartheid basically means living apart, different cultures, different races living apart. So minority white government not allowing anybody else to play, basically. So cricket, what they did was they joined the cricketing body, the non-white and the white mm. bodies were together, and we were then accepted back. Nelson Mandela was being released, the ANC was being unbanned. So the, the international community could see that there were changes happening in South Africa. And because the sporting bodies weren't segregated or separated, the cr cricket was the only sport, should I say. So hockey, football, tennis, rugby, all the other sports were still yeah. Yeah. only after 1994. So it was a case of me getting selected to play at the Cricket World Cup in 92, but then still going back and playing hockey in the winter. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly we were touring the UK in 1994 for three months. We were in England. So our winter in South Africa is their summer. So suddenly I wasn't available. Uh, 1993 as well, we toured Sri Lanka in September, August, September, because that's the season. So again, I wasn't available to play hockey. So it was more a case of cricket chose me than me choosing cricket above. <laughs> because I really, I retired from hockey eventually in 95, 96, just because there was no longer an off season from cricket. We were starting to play more and more eight to 10 months of the year. But not a conscious decision, I'm gonna follow cricket. Cricket was the one sport. If, it, if hockey had come first, I'm sure I would have been playing hockey <laughs> and not standing up here on the stage <laughs> talking to anybody. Yeah, but also I think a question some of the kids had, it, did you feel like you, uh, you were tagged as a fielder who could also bat? And did that in some sense position you in a certain way? And did it make you think about yourself as being a batsman as a second skill? And in some sense have fewer expectations from yourself? I think it, it, it's, it's always an interesting question because when I was playing, um, I was at one stage of my career in test matches, I was averaging less than 30. You know, and in South Africa, we were new back into the scene. Uh, we had no international players had scored a double 100, not even 150 in tests. So once we got to 100, because we always had fast bouncing green wickets in South Africa, and uh, if you scored a 70 or an 80, even 100, it was, seemed a good score. So none of us were accustomed to scoring 150 or 200. Right. So it took a long time for the batting team to say, hold on guys, this is not good enough. We as a team need to convert our starts. Because test cricket, 250 in the first innings, you're still behind the game. So I think from that point of view, it was interesting that people ask me, am I disappointed no one thought about my batting? I said, it's great to be remembered for something. There's so many good players have played for the last 15 years and no one remembers them. So the fact that I was a fielder who could, a batsman who could field, for a while it took a bit of pressure off me because people would say, okay, he saved 20, he scored 25, so he's averaging 45, but if you go back to the scorebook, it's still 25, no matter how many runs I scored. So we also had very good all-rounders in our team, Klusner, Pollock, Jacques Callis was batting after me, Mark Boucher. So suddenly the numbers 7, 8 and 9 were scoring as many runs as I was scoring. I said, well, do we need John T as an extra batsman? Let's rather bring in an extra bowler, a spin bowler or another pace bowler because he's not scoring as many, or he is only scoring as many as the lower order. So it, for a while, for two years, I was dropped from the test. I played all the ODIs, the one day game, and, uh, but I had to change my technique. You know, so it took, we speak, keep speaking about habits, because cricket is a game of habit. You can't fix something overnight, which is why we ask you guys, practice like you're playing a match. Because if you're practicing the wrong things, or you're getting lazy and getting tired, your body remembers that. And that's how you play in a game. Your practices are so important. It took me a year to change my technique, another year to convert those <coughs> that change in technique into lots of runs to get selected back for the test side. So for two years, I didn't give up. I knew I had to change, and uh, the rewards. I ended my last two or three two years of test cricket with an average of 50, only averaging 35 at the end, but those last three years were with an average of 50 because it was now suddenly up here and realizing that I can't just be a fielder. I have to bat. My main job is to bat. And so you were able to sort of make yourself a batsman who could field as well. But, uh, you know, a common question we get now is among uh, parents of kids who 
feel like, is it worth going through all of these sessions? Uh, unlike football, where there are 22 kids running around all the time and everyone's a participant, cricket has two people at any point of time participating. Is that actually a limited way of looking at sort of fielders as just viewers rather than participants? I think it's interesting because Ryan and I, we do lots of work with, with schools, similar ages in South Africa, so you know the whole spectrum. And there's a, there's a big um, migration almost from a sports point of view. In the summer, cricket is one of the sports and water polo is another sport that's becoming more popular just because it's one hour. And everybody's in, like you say, like football, everybody's swimming and they play and then they're out and they're gone. Cricket, some guys are standing around. But again, the most important thing is that we need to stay active, not waiting for the coach to, be, to, to get you involved. A lot of my career with only one coach and 15 South African players, you know, there were seven or eight guys in the net, three guys batting, seven or eight guys bowling. But as two or three players who were doing nothing, we would then go work on our fielding. Mm -hmm. So it's important for young players to start taking ownership of their cricket and not just waiting for the coach because the coach can only focus you know attention from from a, the point of view of focusing on the guys in front but the other players who are standing around they can start and what we've tried to teach them here is that they need to start taking ownership already not making it too serious it's still got to be fun and enjoyable but they have to start saying okay i can help somebody else and he can help me we don't have to wait for the coach so yeah there's there's also ways of of coaching, there's drills and there's skills that you can do that everybody is involved. But cricket is a game where it's a team sport, but one player versus one player. It often does happen. So you know, you, as a player, you need to learn to switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off. My focus needs to be 100%, now I can be off. 100% relax. And, and I think that's the other one I wanted to talk about was just energy management. There's a lot of conversation now about managing your energy over long periods of time so that you're able to focus when you need to. Uh, when you're fielding, what are the sorts of uh, techniques you use? Because, I mean, clearly when the delivery was live, you were very switched on. What did you do when the delivery was not live? You were clearly polishing the ball, running to the bowler, I mean, using a lot of the nervous energy, but not thinking about the fielding. So, batsmen have ways of switching off and switching back on when the bowler picks up the ball to run in. What is the fielder's drill in maintaining focus when it's necessary? and taking your mind off, sort of not overdoing the, the focus? I think if, if you look at, at batting firstly, if, if test players are looking to score 100 in a test match, they're going to have to face 170, 180 balls, sometimes 200 balls if it's Pujara batting, it takes a little bit longer. But to be able to concentrate for that length of time, you do have to switch on and switch off. And the same thing in the field. If a fielder in India, if in a test match, is nine, okay, you're not playing in South Africa, so maybe it's not 90 overs, but South Africa, what, you bowled us out in 45 overs in the test. We didn't even get to 90 overs. But for a fielder, anticipation, I was always complimented on good reflexes or good anticipation. All I was doing, I wasn't faster, otherwise I would have been a brilliant batsman. No, I didn't pick the line, I didn't pick the length, better than anybody else as a batsman. People talk about Lara and Tendulkar and Ponting and all these great players who, who saw length, who picked length early and got them in good position. No one spoke about that with me. So why was I a good fielder? Was that when the ball, as the bowler turned to bowl, I was expecting that ball to come to me. And if it didn't come to me, sometimes I'd go fetch it. But then I would switch off, relax, talk to my teammate, polish the ball, whatever. And then when the bowler turned again. So the same thing when you're batting. As the bowler turns into come, you switch on, you focus, you're watching the ball. Because you can't expect to have concentration every minute of the game, of your innings, or while you're in the field, because you will drain yourself, you will get tired, and there's no way you can maintain it. But the switch on, the switch off. But the switching on is a 100% switch on. I was expecting every ball to come to me. Then relax. And in some sense, you wanted it. Uh, what about? I definitely wanted it, because I didn't just field at backward points. If the spinners were bowling, there's no good feeling backward point, the ball's not going to come there. Left arm spinner, I was a short extra cover. Pat Simcox, the off spinner, I was mid-wicket, because that's where the ball was going to be. I mean, we had... Very much a game plan in South Africa. Fast bowlers were Alan Donald, Sean Pollock. You know, these kind of guys hit the top of off stump, fourth stump. So the game plan was always to bowl in that channel. So backward point gully was a busy area, which is why I wanted to be there. You know, when, the, when we came to the subcontinent and the wickets were slightly slower and lower and we went full and straight looking for a reverse swing, then I would come to mid wicket because that's where the ball was going to be. So it was more a case of, I wasn't just expecting the ball to come to me. I mean, if I played T20 cricket, I had one season in the UK. Whereas in the first six overs, the ball came, and then I stayed at backward point. And I thought this is where you had to put the ball, kept going to long on, 
cow corner. So after 10 overs, I haven't seen the ball for four. I said to the captain, please, send me out. I want to go where the action is. So the key there was that if it didn't come to me, I was definitely looking for it. But knowing the bowling plan of, of, of my teammates, knowing where the ball was going to be, again, expecting the ball to come. The spinners, uh, and amazingly, Pat Simcox is a spin bowler. For the first four balls of the, of the game, you know, he would bowl good length delivery with the first four balls of the over. But the last two balls, he didn't want the players to be able to play. He wanted them to hit down the ground, so he would always bowl fuller. So because he was bowling fuller, I would start walking straighter. So I, had, I knew what he was going to do. And that's what I'm trying to encourage the guys here. It's not just about my game. It's how am I helping the other players in the team. And that, the, that's what fielding is about. Knowing those other players. Knowing those other players. So knowing Pat Simcox, that after four balls, he wants to now finish. Ryan talks about starting, managing, and finishing the over. The last two balls, I know Pat Simcox is going to bowl it full because he doesn't want to give the guys a chance to go leg side or clear their arms. They must hit down the ground. So I would walk slightly straighter. The first four balls, I was walking to my right because as the off spinner was turning into the guys, they would look to tuck it towards leg for what? And I would walk in that anticipation of that. Sometimes I got it wrong. Sometimes I looked a bit silly. But eight out of ten times, I was in the right place at the right time because I was looking for the ball and knowing where, well, expecting the ball to come in a particular area. Jody, how do you get to the point where you actually want the ball? Uh, I mean, you, you were a great fielder. It's, it's great to, I mean, it's easy enough for you to say, I want the ball because I, there's a great chance I'm going to catch it. But what of people who are less skilled in some sense, or maybe, ha I wouldn't want to say haven't put in enough work, but there's a fair bit of fear that you don't want to let down your team and drop catches. How do you move beyond the negativity and move towards actually wanting to be a part of the action? Is it? being pre prepared enough and even after the preparation, let's say you drop a few catches, what's the mental game of wanting the ball and wanting the catches? I think what I've spoken about from a fielding point of view, and you know, winning matches in, in cricket, it's, it's not just the sexy stuff. It's, it's not, you know, bowling like a boomerang to death, um, bowling two or three great Yorkers at the end and, and, and the guys can't get you away or a Hardik Pandya or a Dhoni with a helicopter shot winning the World Cup with a six of the last ball. Cricket, winning cricket matches, and contributing to your team can just be saving one run. So in the field, if you're looking for one run and you're staying busy, but you're wanting the ball to come to you, because a lot of times, if you don't want the ball to come, it's going to come to you. If you're trying to hide from the cricket ball, it's going to come. You know, especially for younger players, as they're growing up from the starting of this age, when they're 8 and 9 and 10, the more time with the softball, whether it be the rubber or the tennis ball, just getting comfortable. I mean, I have fingers that don't look so pretty because if the ball hits the end of your finger, it is sore. The boys, they know that. So, you know, if it hits the palm of your hand, it's a bit more protection. But there is no shortcut. But if you're thinking, I don't want the ball to come to me, it's going to come. If you're thinking, I can save one run, you want to be involved, it's amazing. Without even worrying about the ball, you'll be in a good position to take the catch. Because when you don't want the ball, your weight is back. You're not looking for the ball, your, again, your body position is wrong. So if you're looking for the ball just to save that one run, your body is in a good position to not just save the one, but take the catch. So often, I've broken, I mean, Herschel gives his finger. So Herschel's a great fielder. As a fielding coach, he was at Mumbai Indians for one season. Um, when I work with some of the bowlers, I've broken the odd finger at, at MI fielding practice, which is not great. But it's because the guys get tired, they don't move their feet. They put their hands out and it hits the end of their finger. I'm not hitting the ball straight to them because in a game it's going to come to the left or to the right. So I'm expecting the guys to take those sort of catches. But when they don't move their feet, they get hurt. So encouraging young players to be in a good position, expecting the ball to come, just to save that one run, because that can make a difference. You know, I was asking them, who won the IPL last year? By how many? One run. One run. That's all it took. So if you were in the team and you saved one run, that would have been the difference between winning and losing. Amazing, it's that simple. So then you're looking for the ball, then you're looking for work. It means your body's in a good position to take the catch. So that is the key. So what you're essentially saying is getting, being prepared enough to let the, the fielding be automatic in some sense. And you're just doing the basic things and allowing the other things to happen. Uh, in many cases, it's the, the tougher catches are the ones where you have time to think. So ball hit high and you're, you're thinking about the context. How do you switch off everything else and just focus on the ball? Like what's the... Yeah, I mean, that is an interesting observation because uh, in, in 1993, uh, I was playing for South Africa in a Hero Cup match in uh, Brabourne Stadium in Mumbai. So before Bhavankedi was the, was the home for Indian cricket. And it was a Hero Cup against the West Indies. 
And I took five match catches yeah. in that match. So I was told afterwards it's a world record. So I, I didn't even know that much. I've only been playing for South Africa for one year that there was even a world record for fielding. So five catches in a game is still a world record. But the last catch I remember was Desmond Haynes. And he tried to slog sweep because he opened the batting for the West Indies. It was so hot and humid, he had heat stroke. So he couldn't come out to bat. He came in at number 11. And he swung the ball so hard and it went straight up. And two of the other catches were diving one-handed catches. And I remember the commentators in the highlights afterwards saying, oh, that's the easiest catch of the lot. Just because it, I didn't have to move, but it went straight up. Those aren't the easiest catches. I mean, the diving ones where no one's expecting you to catch, those are the easiest. Yeah. Because there's no expectation. The simple catches, which is why as a fielding coach, I'm not marking guys that if they drop a catch. Because I know I have dropped catches. I'm marking players, what is their body position? What was the technique? So was it like Hardik Pandya? Was he waving to the crowd? He was a bit of a rock star? You know, was he signing autographs on the side? Or were they ready for the ball? So from that point of view, it's about not worrying about the results. Because too often, and, and as the boys get older, they will start to learn this. If you're just focusing on the results, we are going to win, we're going to lose. Cricket is that kind of game. You have a winner and you have a team that comes second. Okay, so winner and a second place. You are going to score runs, you're not going to score runs. You're going to take wickets or not, you are going to drop them. What was your practice like? Not what was your attitude on the game. What was your practice in the three days or four days before the match? Mm. So focus on the process. If the process is good, and as a coach, I know what the players have been doing in the week, I can't criticize it because I dropped catches. I missed balls in the field. But I never doubted my preparation, ever. I never went into a game thinking, I was a university student. You are legal, you are at university, you studied, you, you had exams. There's nothing worse than going into exam thinking, please ask me this.